Did you know Derek Gervin, Iceman's brother, played 77 games with New Jersey Nets during the 1990 and 91 season? Yeah, yeah. I recall him being on the 90, 91 Hoops basketball card set. I never put two and two together and actually thought it could have been Iceman's brother. I think it's mentioned on his card. Because I used to study those cards religiously, and yet for some reason I didn't actually twig the fact that they were brothers. He had a career high of 34 points. I'm not sure which is more surprising, that he had a 34-point career high or you didn't know that he was his brother. Looks like, yes, everybody knew except Adam. And by the way, listeners, you are listening to the premier NBA history podcast. <laughs> You're not knowing who Derek Given was. <laughs> I always like to say that Michael got to play with me for a year at North Carolina. <laughs> I think it really helped him. Spectacular player from the beginning. You can see right away Jordan was going to be a big-time scorer. And showed what an impact he was going to have on the league. This is NB86, celebrating the 30-year anniversary of Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls' 1986 NBA season. And now your hosts, Adam Ryan and Aaron Steen. Welcome back to another episode of NB86, up to episode four of the series. Thanks for joining me again, as always. Aaron, how are you today, mate? I'm good, mate. Really good. Good to hear. NBA News Notes and Quotes November 9th through 23rd, 1985. On November 9, Joanne Oldham spent a night in the baddest party town in America, New York City, in his hotel room, resting his twisted ankle from the Bulls' previous loss at New Jersey, wrote Bob Sakamoto. Oldham said he wanted no excuses in his upcoming matchup against the NBA's newest super rookie, Patrick Ewing, at Madison Square Garden that night. Oldham last matched up against Patrick in the 1980 Olympic trials when Ewing was the only high schooler invited to the trials. How good is that? I had no idea that Oldham was part of those Olympic trials and, of course, the USA boycotted that Olympics. Still, good little fact there, mate. Well done. We are nothing if we are not the tidbit experts. True. New York was 0-7 at this point of the season and had dropped 19 in a row dating back to the previous season and nothing was going right for them after suffering a rash of injuries aside from Patrick Ewing's 21 and 9 per game and the occasional highlight from rookie Gerald Wilkins. Juwan said that the Twin Towers look of Dave Corzine and him with Dave's outside and his inside play that he didn't see too many people who could stop them. I like Juwan's confidence. <laughs> that night, speaking of Oldham's confidence, Chicago had a victory at Madison Square Garden in front of a great crowd, 18,737. They were 97 to 94 winners, the Bulls over the Knicks, and the Bulls improved to 4-4 four and four on the young season. Chicago ended its four-game losing streak. And at the same time, they then kept the then helpless Knicks winless at 0 and 8. For Chicago, Orlando Woolridge had a stellar game, 28 points and 12 boards. Sidney Green, we'll be mentioning his name quite a bit throughout this episode. He had some great stat lines around this time. He had 12 boards. Jawan Oldham, the aforementioned Jawan Oldham, had 14 points and 11 rebounds. And Dave Corzine, confidence certainly was at a high here. He had 20 points. So good stuff there from podcast favorite Dave Corzine. Wonder if Dave still had his sticky taped X on the MSG floor from the eighty four eighty five season. A throwback to NB eighty five, mate, where he was all but dialing him in from everywhere he shot and was telling the bench about it as well. Some good memories there from NB eighty five. And for the Knicks, Patrick Ewing had twenty six points. Gerald Wilkins, very good game from him, twenty three. And Ken, don't call me Staircase Bannister, whose real nickname was actually the Animal, had twenty points. So good times. He was probably my favourite character on the Muppets. The animal. Yeah. I'd probably say Fozzy Bear would be mine. I really liked Fozzy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fair enough. Especially when he did his stand up routines. <laughs> he was very good. Uh note, he's not real. Or is he? Um in Detroit, Boston's Larry Bird scored twenty nine points and Kevin McHale had twenty eight as the Celtics defeated the Pistons handily, one twenty four to one oh five. Dennis Johnson and Bill Lambier were ejected in the fourth quarter following what was described as a brief fight. I'm not sure if that meant they were boxing on in their underwear, but anyhow, <laughs> Boston improved to 6-1 and one on the season. Bob Sakamoto said to forget about the Twin Towers in Houston or the New York skyline as Oldham and Corzine combined for 34 points, 14 rebounds and three blocks in Chicago's 97-94 win at Madison Square Garden. Sears Tower and John Hancock, as described by Jawan himself, 
held Ewing to just four of his 26 points down the stretch of this close encounter. This edition of the Tribune also had an article by Bob Sakamoto titled Jordan Missed On Off Court. Gene Banks called Jordan Snake because of the way he bobs his head back and forth when he dances and said he missed MJ's Yule Brenner looking shiny bald head. It continued that in a situation like this with MJ on the sidelines, the Bulls also missed an athlete of the caliber of Quinton Daly. Yeah, he was sorely missed during this particular stretch of the season. And of course, he was in rehab at this stage as well. So we'll get to Daly a bit later on in this episode, which is good news. On November 10, Philadelphia at home defeated the visiting Bucks of Milwaukee, 105 to 97. Moses Malone had 35 points for the winners, whilst Terry Cummings, shameless self-promotion time, former podcast guest in allairness.com slash 17, scored single digits, six points, for the first time in his career. And that was a streak that lasted 239 games. On November the 11th, the Chicago Tribune printed an excellent advertisement for the Bulls' upcoming game versus their 1985 playoffs opponent, the Milwaukee Bucks. It's titled Kyle Style, featuring a photo of Chicago's Kyle Macy, a picture of concentration attempting a free throw. The first 15,000 fans entering Chicago Stadium would receive a free poster of Macy. The attendance for the game, played on the following day, November 12, was 10,312. So a few excess posters there that went begging. Yeah, the, uh, the Bulls would have been more than happy to put these promotional nights up, knowing that they wouldn't be up for too many uh, of these promotional items. <laughs> In the show notes of this episode, I'll include a photo of the Kyle style advertisement because it's very cool. It's called a free Sony team poster. So there you go. Now, also on the 11th, in the NBA's lone game on the slate that night, San Antonio Spurs defeated the visiting New Jersey Nets 111 to 104. Mike Mitchell led San Antonio with 30 points, whilst past and future Bull artist the A-Train Gilmore had 14 points and 11 rebounds. For the Nets, Otis was on bird song with 27 points, and Buck Williams had a great game, notching 21 points and 11 boards. On November the 12th, Chicago had their collective pants dropped and backsides smacked <laughs> as Milwaukee strolled into Chicago Stadium, punishing the Bulls 132-103. to the crowd of 10,312 could do nothing but watch their hometown Bulls succumb to near irrelevance by game's end. For the Bulls, Orlando Warriors had another great game, 31 points, stepping up in Jordan's absence and even Quinton Daly's absence offensively. Dave Corzine, 14 points and 10 boards. Sidney Green had 19 points. Gene Banks, 16. And Kyle Macy, 13 points, 5 assists and 1 poster. For Milwaukee... <laughs> For Milwaukee, Terry Cummings had 26 points and 10 boards. Sid the Squid Moncrief, 22 points. Ricky Pierce, 14 points. And all 12 bucks scored. Ricky Pierce, former podcast guest. In Orlandis.com slash 28. Hello to Ricky if you're listening. The Chicago Tribune dubbed the game the Battle of the Beatons. The Knicks finally snapped their losing skid, defeating the winless Suns 103-93 to in New York. Phoenix dropped to 0-8 taking ownership of the unenviable moniker, hashtag Lewinsky, don't know why I said that, <laughs> as the league's only winless team. Patrick Ewing scored 25 points in his first regular season victory as a pro. As a side note, the November 14 Tribune referred to the first month of his pro career with this startling prose. Ewing has been nothing more than an unpolished diamond in a pawn shop of strange names. At the other end of the spectrum, Kareem, not the Philadelphia spectrum, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, signed a one-year contract extension earlier in the day that would make the 86-87 season his 18th in the NBA. It was actually reported that he had retired three seasons previous to this one. <laughs> he continued to just extend his contract after multiple rumours, and we talked about it in NBA 85, the times where apparently that season was going to be his last as well. So he continued on, the captain. He celebrated the fact of this contact extension by scoring 21 second-half points later that same day, guiding his Lakers to a 119-100 to home win over the Utah Jazz. Coach Albeck said that the Bulls would probably be without Jordan until January 1st and that the team would have a strong bench on Jordan's return with everyone having to step up to fill the void left by MJ. Also mentioned was that GM Jerry Krause had received word from doctors that Quinton Daly might be ready to return to the team soon, which is good news. I got one out of two right because uh, Jordan's return wouldn't be until March. 
But in a game that we'll be recapping later on in this series, mate, Chicago at Dallas, they interview Stan Elbeck before the game. They're talking about a Valentine's Day return. So quite off with their anticipated return for one Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Right from the point when he got injured and they found out the extent of the injury, they just kept putting the date back. We've always said that the Bulls suffered one of their worst defeats of the young season in the 29-point blowout to the Milwaukee Bucks. They stayed close with a 61-60 to scoreline at the half and trailed by just seven after three. But the defensive lapses and turnovers mounted in the last 12 minutes as Milwaukee peeled off 38 fourth-quarter points. Coming out of a slump, Terry Cummings hit his first six shots of the game and finished 13 of 24 from the field and lingered around the Chicago Stadium court long after the game talking to old friends. Yes, he's a product of Chicago, Terry Cummings. Now, on that same day, Boston were four-point winners, 118-114, to 114, over the visiting Indiana Pacers. Dennis Johnson had 30 points, and his career high, for what it's worth, was 39 points back in the 81 season. Robert Parrish had 23 points and 11 rebounds, and Larry Bird dropped 18 points, 15 boards, and 7 assists. So the Celtics moved to 7-1 and one on the young season, and the Pacers dropped to 2-5. 10,338 fans witnessed their Philadelphia 76ers hold on for a 110-106 to win over Chicago. Ice, a.k.a. George Gervin, had his best game as a bull with 25 points. He would play in 84 of the team's 85 games in this, his final NBA season. So another tidbit there for the fans. For the Bulls, Orlando Woolwich had 34 points. Sid Green had 14 points and 16 boards, so another great game from him. And Chicago dropped to 4-6. and six. And for Philadelphia, Moses Malone had 21 points and 16 boards. Sadal Threat, former podcast guest, dare I say, in Orlandis.com slash 12, had 19 points and 5 assists. Now, how's this, mate? Did you know, and for the listener as well, Derek Gervin, Iceman's brother, played 77 games with New Jersey Nets during the 1990 and 91 season. Did you actually know that? Yeah, yeah, I recall him being on the 1991 Hoops basketball card set. I never put two and two together and actually thought it could have been Iceman's brother. I think it's mentioned on his card. Because I used to study those cards religiously, and yet for some reason I didn't actually twig the fact that they were brothers. I was quite surprised by that. Um, And also, he had a career high of 34 points, so obviously he could also shoot the lights out as well. I'm not sure which is more surprising, that he had a 34-point career high, or you didn't know that he was his brother looks like yes everybody knew except adam and by the way listeners you are listening to the premier nba history podcast <laughs> you're not knowing who Derek given was <laughs> yeah true we are number one moving on the clippers Derek smith scored 26 points before suffering a knee injury in his team's 93 to 89 loss at home to seattle after a fantastic start to the 85 86 campaign as we alluded to in a previous episode of this series Smith would only play two more games in total for the season. In that previous episode, I said that we'd do our best to try and work out what actually happened to him. He had numerous injuries throughout the season, which then led to him being traded in the off-season before we got to the 86-87 campaign. Bob Sakamoto offered up two perspectives of the Bulls game. The first, a glass half full look at Orlando's game high 34, Iceman's return to his San Antonio rhythm days, returning him 25 points on 11 of 21 shooting, Sid Green matching Moses with 16 rebounds, and that Chicago overcame a 17-point halftime deficit. Then his glass half empty and the fact that it was a Bulls' sixth loss in seven games. Yeah, that was the slight downside. The Bulls ran off a 10-zip run at the end of the third to bring it back to six points and were also assisted by 10 76 turnovers in the period. But the 76ers, that's a lot of numbers, <laughs> reserves had done too much damage in the second for the Bulls to be able to beat Philadelphia at home. The news notes and nonsense in the Tribune on this day reported that McDonald's will be selling a laminated school folder with MJ's picture on it, with proceeds going to the United Negro College Fund. And in another tidbit, don't be Superman, don't be a robot, just be Patrick Ewing. And because of one cheap shot by one jerk, Patrick's doing it with one arm. These were words of advice for Patrick from Knicks coach Hubie Brown. Oh, and a nice backhander to Steve Swinger Stepanovich. <laughs> That's perfect. Because as we alluded to in previous episodes of NB85, Stepanovich loved to mix it up. He really did. He loved the punch on. 
in the 86 preseason. Of course, they're referring to when uh, Swinger took Ewing down <laughs> and uh, it was on for young and old. So, yeah, great stuff there from Hubie. In the briefs of that same day's paper, we learnt a few more key details about a guy we mentioned in episode three of NB86, Georgie Glauchkov. Among the first phrases he learned from teammates were, Fedic Suds, Pretty Girl, Large OJ, <laughs> Give Me Five, and most importantly, Vodka, No Ice. <laughs> <laughs> With the name Georgie Glauchkov, I reckon he'd be pretty familiar to the beverage Vodka, No Ice. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, on this same day, Houston at home extended its win streak to six. They were eight and two on the year. As they took care of business 112 to 107 against the New Jersey Nets, future bull Rodney McRae, along with Akeem Olajuwon and John Lucas, each scored 20 plus for the Rockets, whilst New Jersey were led by Michael Ray Richardson's 21 points, six rebounds, 11 assist, four steal performance. So good stuff there from Sugar Ray. The Sacramento Kings, Eddie Johnson. Inolanders.com slash 41. Hello to Eddie if you're listening. He's a great guy. Scored 11 straight points in the fourth quarter in his team's 112 to 103 home win over Golden State Warriors. In the Tribune on November 15th, Bob Sakamoto painted quite a bleak picture for the Bulls that only a stone-cold optimist would put much stock into. The article outlined the Bulls' upcoming schedule that, according to Sack, had the Bulls at 11 and 20 when Jordan returns after Christmas, making a playoff run a very unlikely one. But little did they know, mate, what was to come. Jordan would be back and the Bulls may indeed have got there through the 86 playoffs. But uh, spoiler alert, 30 years on, <laughs> we might just uh, keep the suspense for that little bit longer. On November 15 as well, Boston won their eighth straight game. So after dropping the first of the season, they were 8-1 and one, with the same scoreline as their previous game, 118-114 to 114 against the travelling Washington Bullets. And for the Celtics, Ainge, Bird and McHale all had 20-plus and Bill Walton had 19 points, 9 boards and 4 blocks. Now that's a great stat line there from Bill. Jeff Ruland, in allannis.com slash 45, shameless self-promotion off the charts this episode, had 30 points, 17 rebounds, 6 assists, a steal, 2 blocks for Washington. What a great stat line that was. And they were only 2-7 and seven on the year. 11,052 Milwaukee fans enjoyed watching their Bucks defeat Chicago 118 to 103 for the second time in three days. The Bulls lost to Milwaukee for Chicago. Orlando Warriors had 21 points. Sydney Green with another stellar performance, 18 points and 14 rebounds. And for Milwaukee, Terry Cummings led all scorers with 22 points. Meanwhile, Phoenix chalked up their first victory of the season with a 117 to 99 win at home versus Seattle. 1984 slam dunk champion Larry Nance led the Suns with 25 points, 11 boards and 6 assists, and Walter Davis added 22. For the Supersonics, Xavier McDaniel, star of the movie Singles, had 23 points. Bear in mind, he he had a cameo of about 3 seconds, but still, it was the scene-stealing part of the entire movie. Have you seen Singles? I don't think I have. Wow. I'm sure that if we go to IMDB, that X-Men will have a, a profile on there, surely, wouldn't he? You just type in Xavier McDaniel singles into YouTube and you can see the clip. It goes for about all of four seconds. I probably won't watch an entire movie for four seconds of the X-Man. Although it's got Eddie Vedder in it as well, so from Pearl Jam, so he plays a bit of a role too. No, still not enough. Adrian Dantley's 41 points steered his Utah Jazz to a 133-118 to home victory over Portland. Michael Sweet Bells Thompson. My goodness. Thank you very much, basketballreference.com. Your awesomeness continues to amaze. That's uh, his nickname. The number one pick of the 1978 NBA draft led the Blazers with 20 points. On the Bulls-Bucks game, Bob Sakamoto wrote that if Stan Alback could find a way to call it quits after three quarters, <laughs> these Bulls could manage until Jordan returns. This after a fourth quarter fade out as Ricky Pierce scored 11 of his 17 in the fourth term as Milwaukee outscored the Bulls 37 to 25. The Bulls actually held a lead 78 to 74 late in the third before nine straight bucks points to finish the quarter to break the back of these try hard Bulls. Now also in the Tribune on the 16th, there was a brief that read as follows, and I'm really glad I picked up on this. Californian Scott Williams, considered one of the top prep prospects, has decided to attend North Carolina. DePaul, UCLA, Villanova, and Georgia Tech also were in the hunt for the 6 foot 10 inch center. Williams said the Bulls Michael Jordan had called him and recommended Carolina. That's cool. Very cool. Given this was back in late 1985, 
it's awesome that a future bull, three-time NBA champion, no less, Scott Williams, who also won three titles in his first three years, how good's that, was called by Jordan personally, and obviously that would probably get you over the line in terms of any recruiting that uh, was possibly on offer. So good stuff there from MJ. Boston's win streak came to an abrupt halt following Clark Kellogg's five-foot jumper off the glass at the buzzer as the Pacers held on to beat Larry Bird in a return to his home state. For what it's worth, the scores became tied at 109 after Terrence Stansbury in Orlandis.com slash 58. I'm loving the shameless self-promotion. Stansbury hit a 25-footer to not the scores at 109. He finished with 16 points in the contest. Even though he had a quiet second half, Bird finished with 33 points, 9 rebounds and 6 assists. Kellogg led Indiana with 21 points, whilst Swinger Stepanovic fought <laughs> admirably to land a very impressive triple-double. Have a listen to this. 20 points, 14 rebounds and 10 assists. From Swinger. And probably one jaw broken. <laughs> Somewhere. It had to have happened at some point in time. Chicago dropped a 132 to 128 overtime game to the visiting Cleveland Cavaliers. Just 9,133 fans attended this contest. It was the first sub 10,000 home crowd of the season, and the Bulls dropped to 4 and 8. Hmm. For Chicago, Orlando Woolridge had 35 points. Dave Corzine had a beauty 23 points, 12 rebounds, and 5 assists. And Sidney Green continued his monster streak of great games 21 points and 10 rebounds. For Cleveland, Will B. Free dropped 28 points. Roy Hinson had 24 points and 8 rebounds. Staring a loss to the Cavaliers in the face, Bulls PA man Tommy Edwards got inventive and played a song to the crowd. Dion Warwick's hit, Take a Message to Michael which didn't impress well be Free and his 28 points very much. <laughs> Free said it would have made the Bulls players feel worse as they were playing their butts off out there and then they get reminded of why they were about to lose their eighth game in nine attempts. <laughs> the Bulls had a chance to win the game, but Kyle Macy passed up an open three to get the ball to Orlando, who was forced into an air ball that sent the game into overtime. This after, Orlando had hit the game tying shot with 46 Ticks left on the clock, the possession earlier. It was after the Cavs went on an 8-2 run to extend to a 128-122 to lead with 102 remaining that Edwards played the song that also frustrated several of the Bulls players. And understandably so. Now, I thought it was Dion Warwick. Is that how you pronounce it? Warwick? Warwick. The LA Lakers moved to 10-1 and after handily disposing of the travelling New Jersey Nets 138-119, to the team's sixth straight W and its best season start since moving to LA back in 1960. Mike McGee dropped 26 points and Magic Johnson had 21 points and 15 assists. For the Nets, the high man was Daryl Dawkins with 19. Bob Sakamoto wrote the following day of the improved play of George Gervin and outlined some news, notes, and nonsense of his own in his article. He spoke of uh, Quinton Daly's impending return, probably during the Bulls' nine-game, two-week circus trip to keep the hordes of Chicago media at bay. <laughs> Six lucky kids would get the chance to have lunch with MJ at McDonald's and then go one-on-one -on -one with him in January. Um, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> Three Bulls were among the statistical leaders in the NBA to this point. Woolridge was third in the NBA in scoring at 29.4 points per game. Gene Riverbanks, eighth in free throw percentage at 92.9. And Juwan Oldham, fourth in blocks at 2.75 blocks per game. These three, plus George Gervin, were all due to be free agents at season's end. And the Bulls were going to have money available at season's end to spend on free agents with... Alex English, Herb Williams, and Terry Cummings, the big names available. There were no games played on November 18th. November 19th in the Tribune had Quinton Daly set to rejoin the Bulls, accompanied by a doctor from the rehab facility for the first two weeks in his home. Q was well protected in the press conference at the Multiplex by GM Jerry Krause. Krause deflected any questions he viewed to be invasive of Daly's privacy, like a concerned father fussing over the prodigal's son, wrote Bob Sakamoto. Questions arose that Q was rushed back due to the Bulls' four-game losing streak. My goodness, you'd hope not. Questions he dismissed immediately in saying he would have stayed in rehab for as long as required of him. He stayed for four and a half weeks of the original six weeks stated. When asked if the Bulls would trade daily, Krauss became irate, saying it was a stupid question and that Q was a human being and he would take the risk for anyone. Irate, that is a good reply from Jerry. 
Chicago had a hard-fought 121-114 to 114 win over Indiana in front of a rather disappointing crowd, it must be said, of 10,433 people at the stadium. The team improved to 5-8 and eight with the victory. For Chicago, Woolridge had 35 points, if you don't mind. Sid Green, 13 boards. Dave Corzine, 10 points and 12 rebounds. Another good double-double there for Dave. For Indiana, Herb the Condiment Williams, that sounded wrong, had 27 <coughs> points. Clark Kellogg had 17 points and 14 rebounds. In Denver, future Hall of Famer Alex English single-handedly led his team to victory over Houston. The only red glare on offer was that emanating from English's hands. you got to think about that one. He had a career-high 54 points on 21 of 30 field goals and 12 of 12 free throws. It was also the highest single-game output from an NBA player to that point in this 85-86 season. Akeem Olajuwon had 23 points and 12 rebounds for the Rockets. On the following day in the Tribune, Bob Sakamoto wrote, maybe Chicago will have its ice age after all. (laughs) Fans at the stadium saw vintage George Gervin with ice hitting 14 of his first 15 shots on his way to 34 points in the 121-114 win. Gervin's play even overshadowed Orlando's game-high 35 points and Kyle Macy's 21. Quentin Daly played six minutes in his return and had two points. Chicago had enough in the tank in the fourth to avoid their usual fourth quarter fade after Indiana tied the game with just under two minutes remaining and a Woolridge three-point play with 105 to go sealed the game. Speaking of vintage George Gervin performances, mate, wait till we get around to late January in 86. Gervin has a performance for the ages and we'll be recapping that game obviously when it gets to that time in the season. Boston remained unbeaten at home with a 115-106 to 106 overtime decision versus Utah. All Celtic starters scored in double figures as they returned to their winning ways, moving to 9-2. and two. For the Jazz, Adrian Dantley had 32, and Big T, Thurl Bailey, had 18 points and 11 rebounds. In Atlanta, Chicago lost 116-101 to 101 in front of just 7,179 the lowest crowd to that point to watch the Bulls play in the 85-86 season, and Chicago's record dropped to 5-9. and nine. For Chicago, Quinton Daly was back into the scorer's column in a big way, 23 points. Iceman had 22, and Charles Oakley, the rookie, 10 rebounds. Good stuff there from Oak. And for Atlanta, Dominique Wilkins, 28 points and 8 rebounds. Very solid stuff there from Dominique. And Cliff Levingston, future Bull, 13 points and 17 rebounds. Magic Johnson had 22 points and 20 assists. In LA's 122 to 107 win over the Crosstown Clippers, the Lakers moved to 11 and 1. And for the Clippers, the other other MJ, Marcus Johnson, who was equally a great player at that stage of his career too, had 34 points. Thank you very much. His third straight 30 point performance. So Marcus Johnson was on fire. The first ever recipient of the John Wooden Award. Wouldn't you know it? We mentioned that in previous episode of NB85 too, for what it's worth. Bob Sacramento asked. Ever seen a 48-minute lab drill? That's what the Hawks ran off in the 116-101 to 101 trouncing at the Omni. Chicago helped the Hawks plenty with 17 first-half turnovers, with the Bulls' lone redeeming feature being Daly's 23 points in just 20 minutes of action. 23 points? He was lighting it up. He was. Probably a wrong choice of words, given he was in drug rehab, but anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that'll probably make the episode. I really would like to include it, but that sounds quite derogatory, and I apologize to the memory of Quentin Daly. May he rest in peace. Exactly. On the second of a back-to-back, the Bulls' defensive efforts were lagging in this game, and the Hawks were aware of this and were ready to take advantage. The Hawks amazingly scored 31 times on layups or dunks out of the 47 shots that they hit for the game. That's crazy. Isn't that a crazy stat? No wonder Bob Sakamoto referred to it as a 48-minute layup drill. He's not kidding. On a side note, one of the first NFL players that I was ever aware of was William the Refrigerator Perry, who played for the Chicago Bears. Mm -hmm. Fridge was selected by the Bears in the 1985 draft and was fast becoming a cult hero in Chicago. The amount of mentions the Fridge gets in the Tribune around this time is extraordinary. He's in the paper every day for some reason or another. So he got anything but a cold reception, the Fridge. Now, Denver's Wayne Cooper hit a 20-footer with four seconds to play, just his second made basket of the game, to give his team a 121-120 to win over the red-hot LA Lakers at McNichols Arena in Denver. Also, McNichols is one of the great arenas that I've admired for many a decade. Loved their old court. Looked awesome. 
Who cares, Adam? It snapped the Lakers' seven-game win streak at the time, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, 32 points and 10 rebounds, and Magic Johnson, 18 assists, each missed would-be game winners in the final seconds. Alex English had 30 points for the 10-2 and two Denver Nuggets. Just on Big Nichols Arena, aesthetically very pleasing to watch. Oh, wasn't it? It was so good. The combination of the parquet court and also one of the, the greatest logos in sports history, the Denver Nuggets logo, the, the Cityscape logo. As you mentioned, a fantastic court. I have Dikembe Mutombo's, I think it's his second career game, regular season game, San Antonio at Denver. I think it was a TNT telecast, and I still can remember vividly the finish to that game. It was quite frantic, and Matumbo, in only his second game, held off the visiting David Robinson and San Antonio Spurs for, I think, a one-point win. Awesome atmosphere. The crowd were going berserk, and it was just so good to watch that court. So I agree with everything you've just said, mate. I recall that game um, being highlighted on NBA Action Back in the uh, the 91, 92 season, hello to Todd Spear if you're listening. <laughs> no, I haven't been able to either dig out those 91, 92 NBA actions yet, mate. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, it was an early November 91 game. I know that for sure. Why I remember this, I don't know. And if you're still listening to this and you're awake, congratulations. <laughs> One guy for the Nuggets who featured prominently in NBA actions, especially early in that 91-92 season, was rookie Mark Macon. Jack the Goose Givens was actually the commentator of this game. How do I remember this? No idea. And I think he was with Ron Thulin at the time, so what a great combo that was. In relation to Macon and Matumbo, he was saying something like, Denver has an inside-outside presence. Outside in Mark Macon, inside in Dikembe Matumbo. Now, that's the worst ever impression of a commentator I've heard. However, I do remember it word for word. Actually, it wasn't too bad. Visually, of late, you've been impersonating Carlos Boozer from an audio <laughs> standpoint. That wasn't a bad impersonation of the goose. Thanks very much. My hairline leaves a lot to be desired. In another interesting tidbit, Orlando Woolridge spoke to students at Highland Park High School about drug use. I'm not going to touch that. November 22nd, Boston at home defeated their arch rivals, it could be said, Philadelphia, 110 to 103, although the Lakers would probably fit right in there too. The Celts moved to 10-2, and two, and Philly went back to 500 ball at 6-6. Six and six. Boston were led by Kevin McCarr's 32 points and 11 rebounds, and for the 76ers, Moses and the Good Doctor had 21 points apiece. The Knicks dropped their 14th straight road game, again heading back to the 85 season, 102-94 to 94 at Washington. Pat Cummings, making up for the missing Patrick Ewing, who was injured, had 34 points and 19 rebounds in the loss. Jeff Ruland led the Bullets with 23 points and 15 rebounds. Pat Cummings with the impressive 34 points, 19 rebounds, and two Gatorade calls as well. <laughs> yeah, true. Good one. On the 23rd of November, Boston at Madison Square Garden defeated the New York Knicks. Of course, it wouldn't be any other team. It's at Madison Square Garden. 113 to 104, behind 27 points from Robert the Chief Parish and 25 from Kevin McHale. You never know. They might have somehow had a cross-sport competition and be playing the other New York Rangers, perhaps. Yeah, what a puck up that was. Um, the victory halted the Knicks three game. That's pretty good. I like that. And that's my own joke. The victory halted the Knicks three game home win streak. The Celtics moved to 11 and two, winning their third straight game. So they were going very well in this early season. In his team's 116 to 106 win at Atlanta, Adrian Dantley matched his season high, scoring 41 points. Future Bull, Bobby Hansen had 18 points and Carl the Mailman Malone. I don't think I've ever called him that, in that, that sequence of words, had 14 points and 10 rebounds. For the Hawks, Dominique had 31 points, 7 rebounds, and 4 assists, so he was still lighting it up for the Hawks in this 86 season after initially allegedly threatening to sit out the season because of a contract dispute. The Bulls were big winners, 135-108 to 108 at home. Again, a pretty disappointing crowd. 10,377 against the Golden State Warriors. Their record improved to 6-9. and nine. And Georgie Gervin. Georgie Gervin. <laughs> hey there, Georgie boy. <laughs> Hello to Georgie Klauskoff, if you're listening. George Gervin had 32 points. Orlando Warriors 28. Gene Banks, 20 points and 9 rebounds. And probably the player of this period of time, even though the Player of the Week award will disagree with me, <laughs> Sid Green had 11 points and 16 rebounds. For Golden State, sharpshooter Purvis Short had 30 points. And Terry Teagle, got to love the alliteration, had 21 points. In Dallas, Mark Aguirre had a blinder, recording a triple-double, 25 points, 13 rebounds, and 12 assists. 
he was ably assisted by long-armed Sam Perkins with 23 points. Indiana's top scorers were Herb Williams and Swinger Stepanovic with 18 points apiece. <laughs> the Mavs were 6-7 and seven on the season. On the Bulls game, Warriors rookie Chris Mullen came up against his idol George Gervin at Chicago Stadium and the head-to-head battle ended in the Bulls' 135-108 to 108 route and 32 points from the Iceman. Gervin's 12 first quarter points were matched by Golden State's high man Purvis Lock. Purvis Short, who went six for six from the field in tallying his even dozen. Chicago led 27 to 24 after one, despite an amazing 11 turnovers in the first 12 minutes. <laughs> that is remarkable. Yeah, amazing, amazing stat. Gervin finished with another 12 in the last term and points, that is, not turnovers, and was <laughs> starting to round into some form after a slowish start to the season. He certainly did warm up, the Iceman. When he gets to January, he really does start to fire things up. Yes, the Iceman was starting to warm up and was starting to flow like a river. <laughs> <laughs> the Players of the Week, November the 10th, Buck Williams of the New Jersey Nets averaged 23.3 points, 14 rebounds and 3 blocks a game as the Nets went 3 and zip. Good stuff there from Buck. On November 17, Patrick Ewing earned his first Player of the Week award for the New York Knicks, of course, averaging 26.5 points, 14.5 boards and 4 blocks per game in two New York wins. Rounding out the highs for this period of time, Alex English's 54 points, not surprisingly, was the leader individually versus Houston on the 19th of November. Bill Lambier had 21 rebounds for Detroit against the Washington Bullets on the 12th of November and the Magic Man, Irvin Johnson, 20 assists against the LA Clippers in their 20th of November contest. Now, just rounding out the NBA standings, mate, through November 23rd, the division leaders for the Atlantic Division, the Celtics were 11-2. and two. The Central Division, the Bucks were 12 and 5. The Midwest, the Denver Nuggets were 11 and 2. And the Pacific Division, the Lakers were 12 and 2. The Bulls were at 6 and 9. They went 3 and 5 during this block of time. And for the Suns, they were the cellar dwellers of the NBA, 2 and 12. So, mate, we're at the end of another episode of the series. Thanks, as always, for being part of the show. Anything you'd like to add, mate, before we do round it out? Yeah, I'd just like to... It's time for some of my own shameless self-promotion. Giddy up. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at inallairness. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash inallairness. Join me next time for another edition of the show. When you said the San Antonio Rhythm Days, I had flashbacks to a a fictitious ABA team called the San Antonio Rhythm for no apparent reason there. (laughs) Kellogg led Indiana, as he did quite often. He was a serial offender. (laughs) Sometimes I think of these things, and it's funny to say that. No, it's terrible. Don't say it. That was a very corny, flaky joke. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a Fruit Loop. Kareem with 32 and 10. Lucky he didn't retire when the newspapers expected him to. Maybe take that bit out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I can if you like, but I agree with what you said. Probably will take it out.